You're now listening to the Fantasy Filler Podcast. Where we put you in the driver's seat every week, all year long. In the NASCAR racing world, from top news stories, latest results, and best fantasy lineups, we'll have you up to speed and out in front before the drop of the green flag. So let's dive in with our host, Vanilla Wafers. From the three-quarter mile racetrack in Virginia to the four-mile racetrack in Wisconsin, NASCAR just got done with its 22nd race week of the season. We will be talking about the final results for the Truck Series, Xfinity Series, and the Cup Series, as well as the playoffs for the Truck Series and our fantasy picks for the Cup Series race. That and more on today's episode of the Fantasy Filler Podcast. Hopefully you guys had an opportunity to watch at least one of these races if you had the option to choose only one. Hopefully it was the race at Road America as Road America had themselves an exciting finish. While the other two races, unfortunately, Richmond Raceway does not deliver on an exciting race. It was definitely a strategy race for both the Truck Series and the Cup Series. However, there wasn't really anything else. It it was one of those races where it's just like if you did really good on your pit stops, that was going to be the main cider. Sure, if you had a fast car, you were definitely going to be near the front or fast truck, but... It was all about who had the best pit strategies at the end. Some people could uh, be a little mixed on that review. I get it. Either way, we're going to be talking about that and more in today's episode. Uh, But yes, we are now on the closing weeks of the regular season for the Cup Series, the closing weeks for the Xfinity Series. But for the Truck Series, they are done with the regular season. And in two weeks from now, they will be starting their playoff hunt at Lucas Oil Raceway as Richmond was the final race of the regular season so there was a lot on the line for quite a few drivers who were trying to make their way in as well as some drivers who were just barely in and at first it looked like a couple drivers were going to be having some problems very early in the race that could um, inevitably lead to them missing the playoffs in the end let's talk about it so without further ado why don't we dive into the first race that happened here this weekend and that of course is the truck series race so without further ado let's dive into it for the 16th race of the 2023 season for the nascar craftsman truck series race here's the final results for the worldwide express 250 <laughs> All right, so this event was a 250 lap event. We had a total of 38 trucks on the entry list. Unfortunately, the two trucks that missed out on the main event was the number 14 of Trey Hutchins and the number 46 of Memphis Villarreal. Unfortunately, these two drivers were not able to make it into the big show. We had a total of four cautions for 27 laps and nine lead changes amongst only four different drivers. In the end, though, the driver that was able to wind up winning the race was not the driver who dominated the most part of this race, but the driver who had the best call when it came to pit strategies there at the end. I'm talking about the number 42 of Carson Josefar for Nice Motorsports, getting his third win of his career, his third win of the season, and bringing all the momentum into the playoffs. He is your winner here at Richmond Raceway. He has been known as more as the wild card driver. Yes, he's been running up front, but he's made some erratic decisions in a lot of races. This race was a cool and collective Carson Josefar. Yeah, the restarts may have been a little hectic. He was trying to make it three wide a few times, but he never put anybody in a seriously bad situation. So I commend Carson Josefar on this performance. This was a well-deserved victory on his part. At first, it did not look like no anybody was going to have anything for Ty Majeski. We'll talk about him in just a second. But Carson Josefar able to climb back when he went on a different pitch strategy than Ty Majeski there at the end, passed him with just a couple laps left easily, and getting that victory, that's just a huge moment for him because it's almost felt like the last two races that he's been been able to win have been mixed with some controversy here and there. So this is definitely going to be one that he's going to be really happy about. So big congrats to that number 42 team as Nice Motorsports feels like they got that momentum, almost the same momentum that they had back with Ross Chastain. Of course, maybe not at the same level as that, but at least they have one driver who is poised to make his way into the championship four. Now, the most dominant driver in this race was that number 98 truck of Ty Majeski, who was able to win stage one, stage two, and lead 168 laps. The only problem was, two problems to be exact, was at the end of stage two, he unfortunately had himself a speeding penalty, which was the first time that Ty Majeski has gotten a speeding penalty since last year, and I do believe it was Worldwide Technology Raceway was the last time he got a speeding penalty. 
So that was absolutely shocking. Still, somehow, some way, before pit cycle started, he was able to get himself up front. It was unbelievable how much speed he had, but they decided to stay out. Now, it almost would have worked if the race was only 240 laps. Hell, it could have been worked if it was 245 laps, but unfortunately, they just missed it by just a couple of miles. Carson Hosevar just had so much speed. The thing about Richmond with its design as well as the layout of the track, the track um, surface is definitely getting a lot older, so tires get eaten up real quickly. It almost reminds you of Atlanta Motor Speedway before they did the repave, how those tires just went off super fast. I think in the Cup Series race, which we'll talk about here later in the episode, I think they were losing like a second or two within the first 20 laps. That's how fast these tires got worn out. So when Carson Hosevar got to the back bumper of Ty Majeski, there was nothing Ty Majeski could have done. It doesn't matter how fast your truck is. He, he basically became the slowest truck in the field, but he thought he had enough of a gap for him to be able to get the victory. So a bit of a bummer for that team, but still, uh, they shouldn't hang their heads on this. They they were able to climb their way back, and I think that's one of the most important things for a lot of these teams is, yes, you're always going to do good when you have a dominant truck, but if you're able to bounce back from adversity in the middle of a race, that says a lot about your team. Now, this was Ty Majeski's fault, but still, Ty Majeski made up for it there near the end and almost gave him the victory. So they should not be a, a, that upset. They should still be upset to an extent because this was a race that was totally totally theirs 100%, but still to be able to come back and finish second and almost get the victory there, that's definitely just shows you how dominant that team was here in this race. Here's the rest of the top five. We have the number 38 is Zane Smith. He did not score any stage points in this race. However, they were able to find something there at the end and he was able to finish third. So good job for that number 38 team. And look at these names. I find these names pretty fascinating. The number 35 of Jake Garcia, the highest finishing rookie and the number 51 of Matt Mills finished in the fourth and fifth position. Jake Garcia, I, I think next year, if he stays with Bill McAnally Racing, I think he's going to be able to be a playoff contender for sure and maybe be able to sneak away with a victory here and there because at first it was definitely a rocky start for Jake Garcia, but look at how he's been the last few weeks. Completely different types of racetracks, and he's been able to run up front. I think this was probably one of his best showings by far, but that 1935 team, they have really figured things out down here in the Truck Series. Christian Eckes is already in the playoffs with a couple of victories that he had. The number 35 team was the secondary team, and they were making steps in the right direction. I remember the last couple of years, they were not able to get even one of their trucks inside the playoffs. And next year, if they get their same drivers back, it's going to be hard to keep Christian Eckes. I don't know where he would go, but you can definitely tell that Christian Eckes does have possibilities to move on up into the X-Fandy series. But if they can keep these two drivers, I'm going to be very excited to see what these two guys can do. Because Jake Garcia, only a rookie, and he's having himself this good of finishes, um, keeping up with the likes of Nick Sanchez and Taylor Gray, who probably have top-tier equipment, and he's able to beat them in quite a few races. So great job for that number 35 truck. I had to give him a shout-out. Here's the rest of the top 10. We have the number 11 of Corey Heim, as he was able to lead nine laps in this race. Unfortunately, he lost most of his positions there near the end. Then we have the number 88 of Matt Crafton, had himself a pretty consistent race, which is what he needed in order to make it to the playoffs. Nick Sanchez in the number two, he was the second highest finishing rookie he finished eighth it almost spelled um, disaster for the team on lap one because he hit the wall exiting turn two luckily it wasn't that much damage they were able to keep themselves in the hunt so no problems there he's able to finish inside the top 10 then you got grant infinger the number 23 finishing ninth and round out the top 10 was the number one of william sawalich i i butchered that last name i do apologize i know he's a part-time runner here in the truck series and uh, there's been a lot of excitement for the drivers who are coming on here and so for him to be able to get a top 10 in this race and run really consistently that's big for tricon garage especially for their part-time team now there were some drivers here who struggled near the end that we should give a mention to the number 52 of Stuart friesen needed a good race today and he did not get it not at all he finished 27th in this race three laps down now, he had some bad luck in this race. There's no doubt about that. There would be some opportunities where he was a, where he could have got the wave around, and he missed it by just inches. I, I remember when um, Dean Thompson got around, and Haley Deegan and the number 52 of Stuart Friesen were side by side, and Haley Deegan just had a couple inches on him, just a couple inches, so he was not able to get back on the lead lap. Things just fell apart more and more for this team, and they're not in the playoffs. 
It really is really unfortunate for these guys. This is a smaller team for sure, and they have been one of the more consistent teams to make it into the playoffs down here in the Truck Series. And now they don't make it in. This is definitely going to really affect this team negatively. Hopefully they can bounce back from it. But Stuart Friesen was extremely upset here in this race. I mean, rightfully so. He just didn't have anything go his way. But for a team that you can almost guarantee would make it in, now they miss it out. And they miss it out by quite a bit. It's definitely shocking to say the least. So a 27th place for Stuart Friesen unfortunately does not allow him to advance into the playoffs. Another driver who needed a good race was the number 15 of Tanner Gray. Tanner Gray just had bad luck in the last two races here in the truck series. Pocono, he got into an early race wreck. And then this one, he spun out early in the race and it just really just took himself. No, he didn't spin out. He actually was having some mechanical problems. Excuse me on that one. So he was never able to really bounce back. But and, but he needed a victory, and unfortunately, he was not able to get it. Finishing in the 17th spot, though, was Matt Benedetto, as he was able to qualify into the playoffs. Good job for him, as he ran really well at the first stage, and that's really all he needed to do after that when Stuart Friesen was going multiple laps down. The team just needed to run consistently between 10th and 20th. Now, there was a point where he almost got into an accident involving the number 34 machine of Josh Rayom when Josh Rayom was having some problems, went down to pit road, almost got T-boned by, not T-boned, rammed, um, fender-bendered by Matt Benedetto, and that would have been terrible for the 25 team but I still think he would have been able to make it in just by how rough Stuart Friesen was doing here in this race so big congrats to that team they've been trying to make it into the playoffs for the last couple of years as well as they are a newer team and Matty Benedetto and this team finally were able to put something together and for them to finish 17th and make their way into the playoffs that's absolutely huge we'll see if they're able to make it into the round of eight as far as drivers who got into some big incidents or were not able to finish the race that number is zero Everybody was able to finish this race. Josh Rayum did sit in the garage area for some mechanical problems, but they were able to get that truck going as he is credited with the 36th position, but he still was able to complete 239 laps. So everybody was able to run 235 plus laps and be there when the checkered flag flown, which is I think only the second time this year. So, hey, big shout out to these teams to be able to stay consistent out there on the racetrack and not really destroy vehicles out there um, especially for the smaller teams or the drivers who are inexperienced it was a very clean race down here in the truck series that could upset some people because they expect short track carnage well the way new hampshire is set up or not new hampshire holy crap i'm making a lot of mistakes here early uh richmond raceway uh, <laughs> it doesn't really race like um a small track anymore it's definitely all about pit strategy it's almost like a road course so i mean that could leave a sour taste in some people's mouths but hey and this just shows that who are the strongest teams overall when it comes to the crew chief, the pit crew, and the driver. So let's look at the 10 drivers who will be racing for a championship this year. In the first spot with 230 points, thanks to being the regular season points champion, as well as winning five stages and two victories, we have the number 11 of Corey Himes sitting at 2,030. In the second spot is the number 38 of Zane Smith. He also has two victories and four stage points, scoring a total of 22 playoff points. So he's at 2,022. In the third spot is Carson Josevar with 2021, thanks to his three victories and two stage wins. In the fourth spot will be Christian Eckes in the number 19 machine with 2019 points, as he has two victories as well as four stage wins. In the fifth spot, we have the number 23 of Grant Enfinger, as he was able to get two victories this year and one stage victory. And then in the sixth spot, the number 98 of Ty Majeski, not able to get a victory yet, but his consistency with stage wins definitely helped him out here as he was able to get four, so he sits with 2,000 and 14 points. In the seventh spot is the number 99 of Ben Rhodes, who, by the way, had himself a pretty decent race, but unfortunately had a pit road violation there near the end, so that's why he was not able to finish inside the top 10. He will start with 2,013 points with his one victory and one stage win, so he will be sitting at 2,013th and 7th. In the eighth spot, Nick Sanchez, the only rookie to make it into the playoffs in the truck series. He will be starting with 2,005 points, thanks to his two stage wins. And the final two spots, we have Matt DiBenedetto, and the number 88 of Matt Crafton. They'll both be starting out with 2,002 points thanks to Matt Crafton's one stage win and for Matt DiBenedetto as he was able to finish ninth. So that gives him two points. 
So those will be the 10 drivers racing for a championship here this year. It will start here in a couple weeks when they race at Lucas Oil. The drivers who missed out, who will try again next year, hopefully, will be Stuart Friesen in the 52, Tanner Gray in the 15, Chase Purdy in the number four, Tyler Ankrum in the number 16, and Jake Garcia in the number 35, as well as others. Unfortunately, they were not able to put a regular season together to get them inside the top 10. Now let's move on into the Xfinity Series race. They're still in the regular season. They just had their 20th race here at Road America. So without further ado, here's the final results for the Road America 180. All right, so in this race, we had a total of 37 cars on the entry list, meaning that we were able to have all the drivers on the entry list running the main show. Uh, actually, they were short by one car, which is actually pretty fascinating. I thought they had 38 in this race, but maybe someone withdrew that I did not recognize here at the end. Either way, we still had everyone run in the main event that was still remained on the entry list. We had eight cautions for 15 laps. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but when you realize that this race is only 49, 49 laps long, yeah, there was a lot of time when this race was ran under caution. And we only had two lead changes amongst three different drivers. It was really dominated by one driver, but unfortunately he overran one of the corners and it unfortunately cost him big time. So the driver who was able to get the victory was from Junior Motorsports, but the biggest thing was it's his first ever victory here in the Xfinity Series. I'm talking about the number one of Sam Mayer finally being able to put everything together to get his first victory here in the Xfinity Series. A driver who was one of the bigger prospects earlier the last couple of years and he just was pretty um he plateaued here in the xfinity series just trying to get that first victory now he's able to do it now he guarantees that he will be running for a um, championship when here in the 2023 season so big shout out to sam Mayer to be able to get this victory i think the best way to describe this race is just solely on the last couple of laps because the the first 90 percent of the race was dominated by justin allgaier Justin Allgaier was able to win both stages, lead 42 out of the scheduled 49 laps, so he was very, very dominant here in this race. The only one that could really keep up with him was A.J. Allmendinger, and that was earlier in the race since he started on the pole, but he slowly fell off while Justin Allgaier had that speed. But there at the end, we had a crazy, crazy restart with just a couple laps left to go, and Justin Allgaier overran one of the corners, and that gave an opportunity for drivers like Sage, Karen, Parker, Kligerman, and Sam Mayer be able to run for the victory, and that was huge. That was a lot of fun to watch. It was very entertaining there. If you haven't watched the highlights, the words cannot describe how crazy those last two laps were, seriously. But Sam Mayer was the one who made the least amount of mistakes. Uh, there in the top five and trust me all these drivers made mistakes there was no one who had themselves a clean lap with two to go it was absolutely insane but Sam Mayer was able to hold off Parker Kligerman to get his first ever victory and this has to be a good feeling for Junior Motorsports because they know that Justin Allgaier is very consistent they know that Josh Berry can run for victories it's been these other two cars that they've been struggling with Sam Mayer has been consistent, but he has not been able to be close to victory lane. Brandon Jones really has been struggling in that number nine machine, and I'm going to be honest with you. I don't see him making it into the playoffs at this point. His performance has just not been that great, but they needed at least three of their cars to be running well because when you only have two cars running, the other two cars just really struggling, then you know that there's some serious in issues on the inside. But Sam Mayer, we, we knew the talent was there thanks to his championship down the Arca East Series, I do believe it is. So I think at one point he was considered like the fifth best prospect. I think that was back in 2021. I, I think that's what it was. It, it was like when Austin Cedric was the best Cup Series prospect. Uh, Sam Mayer was right there in that mix, along with Ty Gibbs, who, by the way, those two are still bitter rivals. But Ty Gibbs was super successful, and Sam Mayer eh, was not nearly at the same point. But for him to get this victory, that's definitely going to help out this team. So great job for Sam Mayer to get that win. Now in the second spot was Parker Kligerman. Parker Kligerman's doing everything he can to lock himself into the playoffs. He was very, very close. But at the very least, he was able to make a tiny bit of ground on the cutoff line. Now, the one person that... I think a lot of people were thinking that he was going to be able to catch up to a lot was going to be Riley Herbst. Well, Riley Herbst was able to finish fifth in this race and score 37 points, while Parker Kligerman scored 38. So Riley Herbst did not 
really struggle here in this race. Ran really well. The one who struggled was Sheldon Creed, a guy who we consider a great road course driver he finishes 26 only scoring 11 points so that definitely shortened uh, the cutoff line here as now Sheldon Creed only sits 22 points above the cut line while Parker Kligerman is right there behind him and Riley Herbst is able to get past Sheldon Creed so it is definitely starting to tighten up ever so slightly here but Sheldon Creed someone who felt like we had a good cushion that's kind of disappeared that it really has so he needs to be really smart here in these next few races i'm very curious to see what happens here in the upcoming road courses because they're going to be racing in the indianapolis road course they're going to be racing at Watkins glen all three of these drivers have shown some success at one point or another at road courses maybe sheldon creed and parker clicker in a little bit more than riley herbs but sheldon creed's been struggling with his executions here at these road course events while Parker Kligerman has been running near the front in most of these races. So this could be the biggest difference maker as far as who's going to be in that final spot if we don't have any new winners outside the top 12 in points. So this will definitely be um, something that we're going to have to keep a close eye on. But Parker Kligerman did his job while Sheldon Creed really struggled in this race. Let's go through the rest of the top five, or, or let's actually go through the rest of the top ten, because there's some people we need to give shout-outs to. Finishing third was the number 21 of Austin Hill. Somehow, some way, this man always finishes in the top three. It's pretty impressive, honestly. In the fourth spot was the number 24 of Sage Karam. Sage Karam, we gotta give credit to. He had himself a spectacular race in that number 24 car. This team did phenomenal as they were also able to get their other car, the number 26 of Kaz Grawl, to finish seventh. So both their cars being able to finish inside the top 10, that is a huge victory for this team. For some reason, I'm drawing a blank on what their name is. Give me one second. I do apologize on that. I want to say Sam Hunt Racing, but I don't think that is correct. I think I'm thinking of the older team that ran a Toyota that had their number in the 20. Uh, yeah, oh, it's Sam Hunt Racing. Okay, my apologies to all the Sam Hunt fans, and my apologies to any of the Sam Hunt team members who listen to this podcast. You guys had yourself a phenomenal performance here at Road America, and Sage Karam being that close to getting the victory, that was very impressive. That really was, and this team has nothing to be ashamed of. I think this gives them a lot more momentum and a lot more motivation to run even better in the next few road course races because there's still an opportunity. Uh, we know Kaz Grala runs really well at road courses. We've seen it even all the way up into the Cup Series when he subbed for Austin Dillon. But Sage Karam, you know, with his IndyCar background, he, he knows how to run in these road course events, and he showed it here in this race. There could be a chance that these guys could sneak away with a victory. If the, if the cards are played right, they could be up there. So definitely a lot of good things going on here for this team. And for both of them to get a top 10, Sam Hunt Racing has to be really proud of that. Riley Hurst, we just talked about him finishing fifth. Josh Berry was able to finish sixth, even though he ran into some problems there near the end of the race involving him and A.J. Allmendinger. Uh, in the seventh spot, Cass Grala. In eighth place, we had the number 91 of Josh Balicki. I'm a fan of Josh Balicki. I know him. Or I wouldn't say I know him. I've talked to him a few times outside the racetrack. And he is a really, really cool guy. So for whenever he's able to finish in the top 10, that's great. He definitely excels when it comes to road courses. And this is a perfect example with DGM Racing. Being able to get that top 10 finish for this number 91 team. That's a huge accomplishment. So really, really good job for them. And they also got stage points. So they were running around in that top 10 mix this entire time. So good job for Josh Balicki. AJ Allmendinger, he had himself a good car at the beginning, but slowly but surely it just worn off. And a lot of people are going to be questioning his decision to run this Xfinity Series race when he should have been focusing on Richmond. Unfortunately, this was a deal that was made at the very beginning of the season. So he was going to run this race regardless of where he was as far as points went. It just so happened that unfortunately things didn't work well here in this race. And we'll talk about how he ran in the Cup Series race. And then rounding out the top 10, the number 9 of Brandon Jones. Just able to sneak his way into the top 10 there near the end. But unfortunately, since he did not get any stage points, he doesn't really make up any ground on the cut line. So... Uh, unfortunate for Brandon Jones, but hey, at least they're able to get the top 10. Drivers who finished outside the top 10 that we should mention, we're talking about Justin Allgaier more specifically. Justin Allgaier, he's just one of those drivers that just seems to have some of the biggest struggles in the world uh, executing races when he should be victorious. And this is another example of it. Now, of course, everyone was making mistakes, but when he made a mistake, and unfortunately, he got turned around, and he was not able to go, keep going straight like the other drivers did. So he finishes 18th. 
But this, this team, if Justin Allgaier wants to rebound, he definitely needs to get a victory at a road course or one of these races coming up because I've seen it happen many times before where a driver makes a big mistake in a race he should have won. It really affects them. It really does. So hopefully that is not the case when it comes to Justin Allgaier here in the coming weeks because 42 laps in a 49 scheduled lap event, that's pretty impressive. At least he was able to get two playoff points. So it wasn't all for naught. At least he was able to get that. So that's going to help him when the playoffs do start here for the Xfinity Series. You also had Cole Custer. He unfortunately did not get a good finish there at the end. He was caught up in that accident that infect, that affected people like um, Josh Berry and AJ Allmendinger. He got a lot of damage, same with Sammy Smith. As those drivers ran really good in this race, Cole Custer was right there, right behind Justin Allgaier the entire time. But unfortunately, he was caught up in an incident that he should not have been a part of. And he finishes 30th, while Sammy Smith finishes 31st. This is one of those products of drivers running really, really hard there at the end. And you're going to have some innocent bystanders. And this was a perfect example of it. So these drivers, unfortunately, do not get themselves a solid finish in this race. But it, it's not going to be a serious, serious issue for them as both these drivers are locked in to run into the playoffs. So I don't think there's really too much uh, pressure here for these guys. But still, it is disappointing. And you can throw John Hunter Nemechek in that mix as he got into an accident on lap number 31 that took him out. John Hunter Nemechek, we've talked about it. He's just one of those drivers that just really, really is chaotic here at these road course events. <laughs> I don't know what it is. He'll run really good, but it seems like something random happens to him. Here's another example. He finishes 34th here in this race. And the final two spots, these are some ones that we should mention. Brett Moffitt in the number 25 unfortunately suffers hub problems here in this race. He is only able to complete 23 laps, finishes 36 overall. That really hurt him towards the cutoff line as right now I do believe now he sits more than a race behind. We will uh, fact check that here in a bit. I, I think he even w got passed by Brandon Jones. He now sits 82 points behind the cut line. So Brett Moffitt, who was a driver who could potentially make it in by points now he's in a must-win situation and to be honest with you I like this team a lot I really do they're not a winning caliber team at this time so he's just gonna have to uh, have some very consistent races and just pray that a lot of these drivers really struggle here near the end of the regular season that's his position right now but this was definitely not a race where they needed that kind of mechanical problem and Chandler Smith finishing in the 37th position this one was a pretty scary one but shout out to Chandler Smith for being really smart so what happened was he he unfortunately lost his brakes in the middle of the race and it, this was going down the front straightaway now if you guys don't know road america is the longest front straightaway that we will see on all the nascar circuit it's even longer than pocono it's a, it's massive absolutely massive and he lost his brakes that's one of the scariest things that you can experience as a driver. Just hitting the brakes and the pedal just goes all the way to the floor and your car's not slowing down. Chandler Smith even though he's a rookie, was smart enough to know if he ran into the wall before he made impact into the tire barrier that he was going to be able to slow down his momentum. And that's exactly what he did. Now, it was still a very hard hit, but shout out to Chandler Smith for really making that decision in a time where not many people would think about that. I think Jeff Burton said it himself. He's like, I don't know if I would have been able to think about that in that moment. I would have did my best maybe to try to spin the car around or try to hit as much of the dirt as I or the, the gravel as I could to slow me down. But Chandler Smith, uh, you got to give credit to that. It's very unfortunate that the situation happened. But thank goodness he was all right. Because we saw Alex LeBay with a similar brake issue, and he did not do that. He ran into those tire barrier, knocked the air out of him, but he is okay. Uh, don't worry, he finished 33rd overall in this race, and that 08 machine was okay. But man, two incidents where brakes gave out, and you can see a driver who was very smart in that situation kill the momentum of the car, and one where he wasn't able to kill the car's momentum, and you saw how massive the impact was between them. So overall, this race... It was really a one-man show, but there at the end, it was super exciting, and sometimes if you have yourself just a crazy last couple of laps, it can save a race, and I think a lot of people really enjoyed the ending of this race. Now, there was people arguing, should NASCAR Cup Series return back to Road America? I'm leaning towards more no, because yes, we had that exciting finish here near the end, but let's say we don't get that late race caution, then everyone's like, yep, this was a good decision. This was a really good decision. I, I, I just don't... Road America is not a great track for the Cup Series. I hate to admit it because I like Road America. But, I mean, the track's way too big. 
and it's very, very strategic of a racetrack, kind of like Sonoma. And uh, let's be honest, Sonoma is not the most exciting. I love Sonoma because I get to attend the race, but we don't want multiple races like that, especially when uh, road courses are really looked at fondly here in the NASCAR Cup Series. So I think Road America is good where it's at right now, having the Xfinity Series. I really don't think it needs the Cup Series right now, but at least we got ourselves an exciting finish here near the end now we're going to be moving back to virginia for the 22nd race of the season this is the main event that everyone's been talking about without further ado let's dive in to the cookout 400 at richmond Alrighty, so this race was 400 laps long meaning the total mileage of this race was 300 miles this race was completed just barely over three hours the exact time was three hours and two minutes it was a very very fast race we had a total of 36 cars on the entry list all of them the charter cars we only had three cautions for 21 laps only one of them was due to an incident and the lead changes were there was quite a few lead changes there was 18 lead changes amongst eight different drivers this was mostly due to the fact that there was a lot of pitch strategy here so basically this race was going to be determined by not only who's someone who had a pretty decent car that could run in the top five but also had the best pitch strategy in the end though it was a driver I did not even talk about in our fantasy picks. And I feel really, really bad about that because I looked at that name and I thought to myself, maybe. And then I was like, nah, nah, I don't I don't think he's going to be able to finish in the top 10. Well, he won the damn thing. It is his third victory here in the NASCAR Cup Series. Locks himself into the playoffs. I'm talking about the number 17 of Chris Busher led 88 laps here in this race, was able to finish second in stage two, had himself a great performance. How about that? Seeing Chris Busher, a driver who was able to win last year in the playoffs, but he wasn't in the playoffs. Now he'll be in the playoffs this year, and he has already some good momentum for that 17 car. Uh, Chris Busher, he, he he played this race smart. He really did. He, he had a lot of speed early in the race. It seemed like, at, for the most part, he was behind his teammate, Brad Keselowski, as Brad Keselowski looked to be the faster car out of RFK, but he was not making mistakes. Chris Busher kept it as a super clean race, and the pit strategies were very, very smart on his end, and he was able to win this event. So great job for Chris Busher on that. It was a well-deserved win, and it's like one of the only few races uh, this season where a driver who did not lead the most laps was able to get the victory he did lead the second most laps but still Chris Buescher great job for him and great job for RFK Racing as a whole uh, for anyone who was thinking that they were going to be a struggling team um They've really proved us wrong. I'm very impressed on what they've been able to do. It's a shame Brad Keselowski hasn't gotten his victory yet, but if they keep running this way, you know that number six car will be back in victory lane. It really will, and and, and it will be a well-deserved and also a great nostalgia feeling to see that six car back in victory lane because I think the last time it's won a race was back with David Reagan back in, I think, 2011 at Daytona. It's been a long, long time. But he came very close. In the second spot, we have the number 11 of Denny Hamlin. Denny Hamlin, super consistent here in this race. Able to lead 20 laps. Ran around, for the most part, inside the top five. So he was definitely a good top pick. Able to score 49 points. So great job for him. Kyle Busch able to finish third. He was also working on a bit of pit strategy. I think he was more of a top 10 car. But the way he was able to play the strategy there near the end. Able to finish in the top three. So good finish for them. Especially since RCR has been struggling on having a really strong short track package well they figured things out here at richmond because not only did kyle bush finish third but you also had austin dillon number three finish ninth the driver who i also thought could be a good driver to take a gamble on but i did not pull the trigger on him for something something did not tell me that he was going to get himself a solid finish and he got a top 10 so uh, i'm 0 and 2 on my gamble pick so far <laughs> in the fourth spot we have the number 22 of joey logano i thought he ran himself a pretty decent race he was definitely um, the top performer for Penske. I wouldn't say he was the best for Ford, obviously, but he, he, he was pretty good here in this race, and, and and that was a good feeling to have for the Joey Logano fans, especially since it's been a really struggling season for him. In the fifth spot, this is the biggest name, the number 41 of Ryan Priest, finally able to finish inside the top 10 here this season, and as he is able to finish fifth here in this race. And it wasn't a fluke either. He ran around the top seven this entire race. This is what we expected out of Ryan Priest when it came to short tracks this right here if ryan priest is able to do this again if he gets another opportunity in this 41 car and he's able to do this at short tracks then he deserves that spot 100 
And I think at some points it looked like he was going to be able to sneak away with a victory. I think at his best points he was running in the second spot. At his worst points he was probably running around in like the 11th spot. So very, very good job for Ryan Priest here in this race. Um, now I am not afraid nearly as much as I was before to include him at tracks where you could see the Featherlight Series run really well at. If you don't know what the Featherlight Series is, that's the old name for the Whelan Modified Tour. That's where Ryan Priest originated from, and he was one of the most dominant drivers down there. So we expect him to do good at these types of racetracks for the first part of this year. It's just been horrendous since his best finish was only a 12th. But now here at Richmond, he definitely showed everyone, hey, he, he deserves this spot. He, he, he needs a couple more good finishes like this before we can actually start saying and set in stone that, yes, he should be in this 41 car, but at least he makes one step towards that direction. And the sixth spot was the number six of Brad Keselowski. Brad Keselowski had the car to beat there near the end. Unfortunately for him, he made a big mistake on green flag pit stops where he pitted at an angle, and it cost him so much time that he lost about five positions when it was all said and done. It was brutal, very, very brutal for that number six team. Uh, they they were the team to beat, and unfortunately, they beat themselves. At least he was able to bounce back and finish six, but I think Brad Keselowski definitely wanted to be in victory lane. I, I'm, I'm sure he's still happy to have his um, driver as well as his teammate be able to win the race, but Brad Keselowski was definitely the driver to beat. Unfortunately, he made a mistake at a very costly time. Seventh spot was the number 19 of Martin Truex Jr. Did not really have himself a strong car, uh, but he decided to do things a little differently in here in this race by doing the least amount of pit stops, and it worked well in his favor. Able to finish inside the top seven when, at, at best, he was probably a top 12 car. So I don't think he was really a top pick, but still able to get 33 points. I'd say that's still good if he was more of your number two, number three guy at best. If he was your number one guy, he didn't really show up at all. Eighth spot, in the number 10 of Eric. Eric Amarola. Eric Amarola uh, able to put things together. Actually, overall, Stuart Haas Racing had themselves a great run here in this race. Ryan Priest finishing 5th, Eric Amarola in 8th, Kevin Harvick 10th, and Chase Briscoe in 11th. When was the last time we saw all four cars inside the top 15 for Stuart Haas Racing? It's been, it felt like it's been a long time, especially for Eric Amarola and Ryan Priest, who have been struggling so hard this year. The same with Chase Briscoe. He's been struggling really bad. The only driver who's been really showing up is Kevin Harvick. It almost reminds me of Nice Motorsports down the truck series. So for them to have all four of their cars finish inside the top 11, bravo to you guys. You guys needed that so badly. And good delivery here. Not only New Hampshire do they have the right equipment, but here at Richmond, they have the right equipment as well. Let's see if they can carry that momentum to Michigan, because if you remember last year, Kevin Harvick did good at Richmond as well as Michigan. Some drivers who finished outside the top 11 that we should talk about here. Uh, first starting with the number 23 of Bubba Wallace. I don't know what happened to Bubba Wallace. Actually, 23-11 as a whole. This team was the most dominant in the first half. The way I was talking about the top 10, you you would think that the Fords and maybe some of the Toyotas like Denny Hamlin and Martin Trex Jr. were the guys to beat. But no, at first it was 2311 racing. They looked so good at the beginning of this race and things just fell apart for them. It really did. Tyler Reddick made some mistakes. Bubba Wallace made some mistakes. It was just not a good turnout for this team when they really should have had themselves a solid, solid, both their cars finishing inside the top five. And that did not happen. Tyler Reddick, unfortunately, hit the commitment box. And so that requires him to do a drive through. And Bo Walls' team, they fumbled really, really bad here in this race. I was looking at some of those pit stops. They were bad. They, they struggled. And unfortunately, this team beat themselves as well. Same with Brad Kislowski. Uh, but at least they were able to get the win here at 23-11. They should have been right there in that mix, and they didn't even get a top 10 finish. So rough turnout for these guys. The only positive from all of this is at least Bubba Wallace got 41 points, so that does help him out as far as the points go for the cutoff line. He was able to make some ground there as 41. That's that's perfect. That's going to always make sure keep you above the cut line unless people start winning. But I really don't see any new drivers outside the top 16 getting any victories anytime soon. So that's the only positive. But 23-11 really did not deliver on the second half. Chase Elliott finishes 13th. He was able to get some stage points, but still not gaining that much ground as he should. I mean, maybe there's a 
there's a world out there where he's going to be able to make it in by points, but it's coming really close. It's just best if he gets that victory. It really is. And I thought he was going to be able to finish inside the top seven. I thought this could be a really good race to take a gamble on him. And once again, he finishes 13th. This is not Chase Elliott that we're used to seeing. He's not anywhere close to being a championship contender. So I don't know what to really think about this one. This one's really tough to see Chase Elliott struggle this bad. But who who knows? Maybe they're really just focusing on one particular race. That would be very foolish of them, and that's very foolish to even really think of that. Uh, Maybe not foolish, more naive. I think that's the best way to go with that. But Chase Elliott uh, getting 13th once again. It's just, gosh, we want top five finishes from him, and we're just not getting that right now. And this should have been a race where he should have ran well. But overall, Henrik Motorsports just struggled here in this event. Uh, we had Ty Gibbs in number 54, unfortunately finishing 15th. He lost quite a few positions there near the end. He was definitely a top 10 driver. So, I mean, 25 points isn't too bad, but it isn't too great either. Uh, Ty Gibbs was another one of those drivers who needed to make up ground. And I guess he did make up some ground to Michael McDowell, but not to the point where it's just like, oh man, this changes everything. Because he scored 25 points while Michael McDowell, unfortunately, he struggled there near the end, and he finishes 22nd, scoring 15 points. Now, this one was a bummer, because Michael McDowell actually had himself a really, really good car. At one point, he was going up into the ninth and 8th position. It was just the fact that his strategies did not work at the same way as Martin Trex Jr., which is weird, because they were both on the same strategy. But Michael McDowell went one lap down and was never able to get that lap back. And unfortunately, that was the end of him in this race. So uh, 22nd place finish was not a good showing for him. He's still able to stay above the cut line, but it definitely knocked a few points off of that gap that he had. So there's a little bit concern right there. Um, as far as some other drivers go here that we move on down, uh, again, Henrik Motorsports struggled tremendously here in this race. Alex Bowman, Kyle Larson, William Byron all finished 18th or worse. Uh, pitch strategies did not work for them either. Uh, the biggest disappointment there, definitely William Byron, as I, I really felt like William Byron was going to have himself a solid race. And at first it looked like eh, maybe a top 10 race, but I had him as a top pick and that definitely was not the pick. I should have went with someone like Kyle Busch, but overall Chevrolet just struggled as a whole. So, but the biggest ones being Henrik Motorsports. I think they are the ones who get the biggest L (laughs) this weekend. It's crazy to think that because they still were able to get all their drivers inside the top 21, but we expect way more out of Henrik Motorsports. Christopher Bell was never really a contender in this race to begin with, and then he also had some penalties as well in this race. I think similar to Tyler Reddick, uh, commitment cone violation, or box, excuse me, they got rid of the cone, and his was um, very, very close, but it was a penalty nonetheless. Uh, Tyler Reddick's was more blatant. You looked at it and you're like, yeah, that's a penalty. Christopher Bell, you kind of could have, it was almost like a lemon test. Like You were just like, mm, maybe, but it, it was, it was. So he finishes 20th overall. And then the rest of the field here, biggest one who struggled in this race that needed a good race was Daniel Suarez. Daniel Suarez finished four laps down, the only driver to spin out in this race. Nothing went in his direction. Big, big disappointment here for Trackhouse Racing. Trackhouse Racing is doing their best to try to get all their car, both their cars into the playoffs. They got a victory with Ross Chastain. They got a victory in their number 91 car, uh, even though that car is only running part-time. Daniel Suarez is just struggling. He really is. I don't see him going anywhere. I don't think this is something due to the fact that he feels like he has a lot of pressure as far as his contract goes up. I think there's a really good relationship they have here. But he needed a good run. And he had one of the worst runs. He lost to people like Ryan Newman with Rick Rare Racing, Austin Sindrick in the two car who was struggling, uh, Noah Gregson who's had himself a really rough season, Corey LaJoy uh, finishing 32nd above him. He was having himself a really bad race, Harrison Burton. These are not the drivers that Daniel Suarez usually runs with. And no disrespect to these guys at all. I mean, seriously, I, there, there's a reason why these guys are running the Cup Series. They're all very talented drivers. But Daniel Suarez is more of running around in that top 15 area. So for him to just struggle to try to even make it into the top 30 just shows you how bad they missed the mark. Because Ross Chastain, he finished 24th. I didn't have too much faith in Ross Chastain in this race. I don't know why. Something just told me that it wasn't going to be a good run. But I did not expect him to struggle this bad. Overall, the racing product, 
it was, I, I'm going to be honest, it wasn't really that great. I, I know people are just like, well, people like strategies and stuff, so this, this shows that you don't like strategy. No, not exactly. If anyone's telling you that, tell them to back off. I think that's the nicest thing you could honestly say to them because this is short track. Short tracks are meant to be exciting. A little bit of bumping and running. The only bump and run we had was Kyle Larson bumping into Denny Hamlin. And we kind of expected that, but even then that wasn't really that exciting. I, I want a race that has a lot more craziness happening. You know, you have a little bit of bumping and banging. I don't want a quarter mile racetrack to, uh, the only concern is dirty air. Dirty air and when you make your pit stop and who has the freshest tires. That drives me nuts to see this at a short track. Like I said, similar with Road America, we don't need another Sonoma. It's fine if you have a Sonoma racetrack here and there, but it should not be a track like Richmond. Richmond should be exciting. Richmond should be intense. It should be like Bristol and Martinsville. That's its competition. I don't care what anyone says. Short tracks go against other short tracks. Mile and a half go against other mile and a half. Road courses go against uh, road courses and so on and so on. And Richmond is not providing that right now it really isn't thank goodness we had a good spring race but other than that if you think of the last five races what has been the most exciting race here at richmond it really has been very limited so they gotta fix something with this racetrack at the very least very least i think they should only have one race here there there's been an argument for a lot of people saying you know there should only be one race at every single racetrack and to an extent i agree i think there's some racetracks that maybe deserve that second um schedule one like charlotte motor speedway maybe daytona maybe martinsville maybe bristol but basically basically the iconic racetracks now people can argue richmond is an iconic racetrack and it's right there inside the top 10 hands down but if this race is track is not producing the most exciting racing it's going to turn off fans to the product and like I said, people can enjoy a strategy race. If you don't believe me, look at Formula One. Formula One's all about strategy. They don't have hardly any kind of type of carnage going on over there. But Richmond, we expect that. Richmond's a short track. It should not struggle this bad. And unfortunately, it is. It's missing the mark right now. And they got to figure something out. If they if they figure out something with this racetrack and they provide exciting racing, they're not fine with it having two races. But... We saw the excitement that happened with Pocono going down to one race. Now we look at Richmond the very next week after, and they produce this type of race? I think they only need one at this point. E either way, I, I give this race probably a 5 out of 10. It's on the lower end. I don't think it was the worst race of the season, but it definitely was not exciting. The only exciting thing was we had ourselves a driver who's usually not in victory lane, able to get the victory, and see RFK Racing really bounce back after years of struggling. They're starting to get a lot of momentum, and this was a perfect example of them having momentum. So overall, I give the race 5 out of 10. I just think that for a race like this, if they don't fix something, then at the best, they deserve only one race. And that will conclude the final results and biggest takeaways in today's episode. Guys, thank you so much for listening. As far as fantasy went, we had a total of 18 people score 200 plus fantasy points. So great job to you guys. You guys did a spectacular job picking the right people. The top three here this weekend were able to score 223 and above. I apparently got my shit together. Excuse my language, sorry. <laughs> but I finally am starting to do good here in fantasy picks because I was able to tie for second with Stuart Haas Racing 14 as both of us were able to get 223 points. But the person who was able to get the victory was Choby Race Fan as he was able to score 227 points. Congratulations to you, good sir. You were the winner of this weekend. Let's look at the overall results as we still have Redhead69 still in first place. But we got Choby Race Fan coming up in the second position. He only sits about 25 points behind to be able to make that pass. In third spot is Chief Joe Coob. Right now I'm sitting in the 11th position. I really need to get stuff taken care of. But, you know, if I make it into that top 10... That will be really neato burrito, and if I can get into the top five, then I'll be very happy. But for now, I sit in the 11th position. Still, 87 members. It's unbelievable how many people we have here in this fantasy league. Absolutely fun, so thank you guys so much who joined. If you want to follow me on social media, look up Vanilla Wafers, and I will pop up on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and TikTok. All of it's NASCAR related. Uh, the bigger videos I post are on YouTube as we just hit 5,000 subscribers, which is absolutely insane. 
I, I'm so happy with that. I, I know I talked about it a little bit in the Saturday episode. I know it's usually the Friday episode, but I was just struggling with the worst headache all weekend. It finally went away, thank God, but that was like a three-day headache. It was, it was driving me insane. But 5,000 subscribers on YouTube, 10,000 followers on TikTok, and a couple hundred on Instagram. Things are looking really good as far as social media platforms are. So go check them out. You might really enjoy them. Again, it's all NASCAR related. Just look up Vanilla Wafers, 33 for Instagram, 44 um, at the end of Vanilla Wafers for TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube. And Twitter's usually the best place to reach me by. I didn't really tweet too much in the Richmond race because there wasn't really much going on, but with that being said, whatever. Next race will be Michigan as we will be doing our fancy picks for that episode here later this week. I would say Friday, but we, we, we kind of learned from that that there could be some cases where I'm not able to do the episode on Friday, but I should be able to unless I get sick. So we should be all good to go for that. So let's wrap up today's episode, guys. I have been your host, Vanilla Wafers, and I I've been able to take you to the front of the field so why don't we grab that checkered flag do some burnouts and head on out so you all take care this has been the fantasy filler podcast